the song that we just sang, the first song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a bulwark, which is an inner wall for defense, in case you didn't know, a bulwark never failing, we will not fear. Martin Luther wrote those lyrics as he reflected on truth from Psalm 46, the psalm that we're going to look at tonight. That song, A Mighty Fortress, uh, penned by Luther during the Reformation, became so popular that since then, it's actually become known, Psalm 46 has, as Luther's psalm. Uh, and for good reason. Those are incredible words uh, to aid our hearts. They've encouraged many believers since he wrote it. And so we're going to derive some comfort from the very same psalm, Psalm 46 tonight. Several weeks ago, I got the opportunity to preach this in equipping hour. And uh, actually in 2020, I uh, wrote a blog post on, uh, from that psalm to encourage our church. And so this has been a psalm that I have drawn on for quite some time uh, and finally doing the work to, that it takes to preach the psalm, that the psalm has become that much clearer in my own mind and that much more encouraging for my own heart. And so I'm not ready to move on from Psalm 46 yet. I'm not going to re-preach the psalm. Uh, you can reference the equipping hour sermon several weeks ago for that. But tonight, what I want us to see is strategies for making God our refuge. We desperately need to know how practically to accomplish this. And the psalm itself has those practical instructions for us. It gives us a way forward to making God our refuge personally, corporately, in an enduring way, and so we're going to return for that purpose. Let me pray and just ask for God's blessing on our time. God, thank you so much for giving us your word, for speaking to us, and for delivering a clear word through your prophets. I pray that these timeless words, these timeless truths would impact our heart in ways that we couldn't plan ourselves. God, use your word to uproot idols in our own heart, things that we hold dear, that we cling to currently as refuges, perhaps even unknowingly. Maybe we haven't stopped long enough to take the time to discern these things happening in our own hearts. And I pray that tonight would mark a, a moment uh, for us that we would give time, give thought to considering uh, where our hearts may be wayward, uh, ways that we need to loosen our grip on the things in this world and lay hold with both hands of your character, uh, your truth in a believing way that would affect us uh, in the here and now and on into eternity as well. And we ask all these things by your grace on Christ's reputation alone. Amen. Just to briefly review, if you're in uh, Psalm 46, I want to just start by reviewing this uh, psalm. And uh, the best way to do that is just by reading it. You have on your outline uh, just a translation of the Hebrew text. I, I hope that this is going to be helpful um, just so that you can see some different nuances. What I tried to do in giving you a translation with uh, fear and trepidation, you know, as, as I am where I am with, with handling the language, but I think there are some significant things to see here that hopefully will be brought out in uh, the way that I translated it for you there. Um, so what I'm going to do just to begin uh, our review of this passage, I'm going to read the passage in the NASB and then uh, reread it 
uh, in, in this translation in my own, just to see some, some nuances that will hopefully be helpful to us. To begin, uh, the inspired text begins in the New American Standard Bible for the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah set to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning, morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Come, behold the works of Yahweh, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. And now again, you'll notice some features here, uh, most notably in verses two through three, that word you see re recurring, though, 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 numerous times, uh, four times to be exact, the word though is given. And that's actually uh, not the best way to translate that. The word though is not in the text of the Hebrew. Um, but what the translators are doing there is they're taking a, a, a specific word in the Hebrew and trying to determine if it has a what's called concessive flavor. That is, even though this, this is true, even though this, this is true, they're trying to capture that. Um, that would be the concessive way to take that word. Uh, the better way to take this word, though, is actually a temporal, which just means it has a temporary or a time element to it. So the word should be translated with a time flavor, just meaning when. And, and as I read through, I'll, I'll talk about why that interpretation, again, is important. So again, uh, Psalm 46, for the choir director of the sons of Korah to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength and abundantly available help in distress. On thus, we will not fear. When the earth causes change and when the mountains shake into the heart of the seas, its waters will roar, they will foam, mountains will quake with its roaring. Selah. A river. Its channels will gladden the city of God, the holiest of the dwellings of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be shaken. God will help her, resulting in morning dawning. Nations roar, kingdoms shake. When he raises his voice, the earth will waver. Yahweh of hosts is with us. Our refuge is the God of Jacob. Selah. Come and behold the deeds of Yahweh who appoints desolations in the earth, who makes war cease to the end of the earth. He will smash the bow into fragments and cut up the spear. He will burn the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yahweh of hosts is with us. Our refuge is the God of Jacob, Selah. Those Selahs divide up the psalm neatly into three movements. If you imagine an orchestra playing this psalm, which would have happened after the uh, musical divisions were made in David by King David during his time, and then in subsequent generations, Israel would have preserved 
uh, those divisions and songs, psalms would have been sung in the temple led by the Levitical uh, priests, the specific divisions who were serving in that way specifically full time. Uh, They would have devoted themselves to this area of Israel's religious life, the the songs, the uh, hymns of, of Israel preserved for us in the Psalms most prominently. The orchestra, the, the men and women singing uh, in the temple worship, have this psalm for them neatly divided into three movements. Uh, you imagine three movements as the song is sung, and it sort of is neatly divided into these three scenes in each of these movements. And the whole psalm, the purpose of it is to compel the hearers that would have been Israel during their time, uh, as well as the church in the New Testament, compelled us to one purpose, and that is to make God our refuge. To make God our refuge, to make God our hiding place, the one to whom we retreat for safety and protection. This is to compel us to do that practically in the here and now. And so the way just in the outline that you have for you that I divided the the Psalm and this could be divided. uh, You can call this by different terms, obviously, but uh, just the the titles that I gave to each of these movement movement. Number one would have been an anticipate an anticipation of cladic cataclysm tongue tongue twister an anticipation of cataclysm. Maybe when you're uh, tongue tied on your own outline, you should make it simpler. This is what's being anticipated. And the reason that's important, just to draw our attention again, back to verse two, the temporal translation is significant instead of the concessive. First off, because the grammar just supports it. Um, There's not a single grammar um, in the, in the few that I looked at that I could find a good reason for taking this to mean though, but the specific translation or the specific word that's given the way that it's written in the Hebrew, one grammar said is an ideal way essentially to translate a temporal use. So to say when is actually a ideal way to have this written, to translate it when. And if you consistently translate the uh, imperfect tenses, uh, you get that in, in, in the Psalm later, I is most notably in verse 10, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And so all the translations really take it that way. And in my opinion, should have just added this, this time element to these earlier verses. And so this is just the grammar supports it. The other reason uh, is because this event that's being depicted in verses two and three is, is not something imagined or uh, just suppose like, hey, if this were to ever happen, that's not what the psalmists are doing. The prophets who actually wrote this psalm, they're not suggesting that something that could happen or might in some t- uh, imaginary way happen. They're actually forecasting a real event coming, coming to, to happen. Um, The fact that this is a real event is why some uh, commentators and and some people who study this passage actually place this after a significant earthquake in Israel's history. If you want to, you can turn to Amos 1 or just listen. There was an earthquake that was so significant. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. There was an earthquake that was so significant in Israel's history that people place the timing of the writing of this psalm shortly after it. Amos records this in 1.1, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, 
And in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So prominent was that earthquake, he, needed, he didn't need any other markers. Hey, if you want to know when this vision, when these words were written, it was just before that one, that earthquake. Everybody's aware. Maybe they'll be saying this in years to come, before the Papua New Guinea earthquake of 2022. All right, it was that significant. I think people who place this, even though that's a, a good way to use the internal textual data to try and locate a psalm or the timing of some, some writing, that's actually not a bad practice, but I think they're, they're noting the wrong earthquake is the issue. Um, you'll just notice the details of this earthquake mentioned in Psalm 46 don't exactly fit uh, that earthquake that Amos and other biblical writers reference because this earthquake, according to verse 2, the end of verse 2, says when the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. That's not figurative language. He's not being hyperbolic here. This actually happens when this earthquake takes place. The mountains slip or better yet, shake into the heart of the seas. Look at verse three. Though its waters roar and foam, uh, the mountains quake at its roaring or its swelling pride. So apparently this earthquake, the seismic activity of this event is so significant that the mountains are gone. The mountains actually shake off into the heart of the sea and the heart of the sea uh, is overturned. This, uh, they will roar, they will foam. The idea is that the heart of the seas are being brought up to the surface, are being overturned, sort of like tsunamis uh, being pictured here, where the middle of the ocean is being brought all the way up to the top and onto land is the idea. So what earthquake is this, uh, is this talking about? So I just give you... Um, I'm, I'm going to move on from the outline. These three movements, an anticipation of cataclysm, an exaltation from stability, an invitation to uh, shalom or Israel's rest. This is, in my opinion, a compelling reason to take this as prophecy, to actually interpret this as prophecy. The earthquake is the first feature that I think is a compelling reason to take this as proper prophecy besides the, the clear grammar the earthquake that's mentioned here is actually still future. And I'll tell you what I have in mind. I think what's being described here in these first two verses is very succinctly what the biblical writers subsequent to this psalm uh, would have called the day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord, that period of time when God pours out his judgment and intense fury on evildoers because of unrepentant sin. This is when God has his day finally. The Lord finally has his day. And that is uh, New Testament language. The Lord Jesus will have his vengeance on evildoers. What kind of earthquake would cause the kind of events pictured in verses 2 and 3 of Psalm 46? And let me just tell you, we won't read all of these, but you have three series of judgments in the tribulation or the day of the Lord, all pictured in Revelation. And we're reading through Revelation now. Maybe you've noticed. First, you have the seals being opened, and you have a series of seven judgments from seven seals being opened. Then you have seven trumpets uh, being blown. And you have, uh, with each of those seven trumpets, the seven judgments come. And then seven bowls being poured out and you have, do I have that backwards? No, that's right. Uh, seals, trumpets, bowls. Thank you. Uh, and then with each of those seven bowls, judgments are being poured out in each series of judgments, seals, trumpets, and bowls. You have earthquakes happening, specific earthquakes mentioned in each of those series. And the final one of those, you can just fast forward to uh, Revelation 16. 
just notice what happens with this final earthquake. It's like the earth is just done quaking. This is the final one. And you have it recorded for the Apostle John a long time after the sons of Korah. And he says, this is what happens in Revelation 16. Look at verse 17. This is when the wrath of God is finally finished. Verse 17 says, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it and so mighty. So this is the earthquake of earthquakes. Never before has this been seen, not locally, not globally. And look what happens as a result in verse 19. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon, the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found and huge hailstones and about 100 pounds each, about 100 pounds each came down from heaven upon men and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. This is what happens with this seventh bowl. The earthquake causes not only the city to split into three parts, but the cities of the nations to fall. And you'll notice in verse 20, the earth shakes so greatly that the mountains are said to be running that way, <laughs> right? They, they fl flee away and the mountains were not found. That kind of sounds like Psalm 46, verse 2, when the mountains shake or shake off into the heart of the sea. The mountains are gone. This is why John can record that they were not found. So I think the, the details of Psalm 46 actually better support a future earthquake. The sons of Korah did not have John's details, just to be clear. These are brand new, uh, the, the end of God's biblical revelation. But the point is, it supports an interpretation of a future time along with the grammar. The other uh, feature to mention that I think support strongly a, a prophetic interpretation is the river mentioned in verse four. You can just write down Zechariah 14 verses one through five, and then Ezekiel 47 chapter 47. Uh, both of those clearly prophetic texts and both have a river or a stream mentioned coming out of Jerusalem, coming out of the new temple in Jerusalem. Uh, there is not this stream here currently, and so it's hard for commentators to understand what exactly to do with this stream. That's why people make it, uh, they result or default to an allegorical interpretation, because there's no river. So people make it something other than a river, but it's an actual river. It's just not here yet. And when Jesus sets foot on Mount Zion, on the Mount of Olives, he'll split the mountain and a river will flow through it. That's where I think biblically this, this fits in. So what you have essentially pictured in Psalm 46, so that we can um, move to these specific strategies mentioned from this Psalm, just to put these three sections in theological terms, what you have pictured in these three movements is uh, the wrath of the day of the Lord, and then the blessing of the kingdom's arrival. In, in short, theologically, if you were looking for where to slot these three movements, 
you have the wrath of the day of the Lord. And then what comes after the wrath of the day of the Lord, which is the arrival of the kingdom. This is why in verse uh, six and seven, or excuse me, in verses uh, five and six, it says God is in the midst of her. So it's picturing a time subsequent to the wrath that's been poured out on the world. When God has finally and comfortably arrived is a uh, dwelling in his city. That's the, the her. This is Jerusalem, Zion. God is finally here. He is comfortably situated in his holy city. And this is when this city will not be moved. Right? There is no moving. There is no more shaking for this city. It is unshakable, an unshakable city. Finally, this is it. And this is what all of the patriarchs, Hebrews 11, says was looking forward to. A city that could not be shaken. This is it. The long-awaited king and Messiah and savior of the world dwelling in Jerusalem He has set up his kingdom after he has executed vengeance on evildoers. And the end of verse five says, God will help her when morning dawns. Or uh, if you take this um, just with a slightly different nuance, God will help her resulting in morning dawning, i.e. God being Jerusalem's help will bring about this result a new day. When God chooses to decisively, finally help Jerusalem in the ways that he has promised, bringing about revival among the Jews and all the rest, it will be the beginning of a completely new day never before seen in Israel. This new day is the kingdom. Uh, Again, another reference for you to read on your own when you have some time perhaps this week. Second Peter chapter one says that in this way, by adding all of these things to your faith, you can confidently enter into the, the eternal kingdom. Um, he's drawing on, I think, Psalm 15 to make that claim. The apostle Peter is. And he says uh, in second Peter one that you would do well to uh, give your attention to the scriptures until uh, morning dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Another reference for you, uh, I think, from this song, the, the reference to morning dawning. So if we take this psalm in this way, I think with this understanding of the psalm, it actually gives us tremendous, tremendous strategies and encouragement to make God our refuge. To make God our refuge, uh, a refuge is a place of safety. When things feel uncertain around you, when you need a place or a person to retreat, the place or person you retreat to is your refuge, whether you identify it as such or not conscientiously explicitly, that thing is your refuge. When things are uncertain around you, the person to whom you, you look most is practically your refuge. And as you know, we are tempted. We are inclined to make all kinds of things our refuge instead of God. And so it should be no surprise to us if you know your own heart, your own tendency to be wayward, that we need passages in scripture that explicitly call us to not do that, to make God our only refuge. And so this is appropriate for sinners like us, even those who believe This is still an appropriate call and helpfully packaged for us in song format so we can sing it and so that the truth is imprinted on our hearts via music, the aid of lyrics. And so as we look at these strategies, just consider the things from which 
we need to seek God as a refuge. Refuge from what? Well, generally speaking, anything that you're tempted to be afraid of. Absolutely anything. Anything that you know, I'm afraid of that. If that were to happen in my life, that would cause instability for me. That would tempt me to perhaps walk away from the Lord outright, or that would tempt me to try and take control on my own power of my own strength of the situation. This would tempt me to sin against God if he brought about this set of circumstances in my life. Things like persecution. I would be tempted to be like Peter and deny Christ if people walked through these doors, put a gun to my head and said, deny Christ. I would be tempted. Okay, well, persecution is something for which you must fortify your heart and determine to seek God as a refuge. Things like lesser forms of persecution, perhaps slander, accusations against your character by loved ones, by dear friends. Would you be tempted to sin against God if that happened? Would you be tempted to take control and on your own strength, try to control and manipulate the circumstances? Well, then that is something for which you need to prepare your heart to seek God as a refuge. What about a fear of death? Are you afraid of death? Are you afraid of perhaps maybe not dying any kind of way, but there are some specific ways that you have in mind. Oh, if that was a way that I uh, had to go, I would be tempted to sin against the Lord. I would be anxious Maybe even me saying that, you're like, why did you even say that? And bring that to mind. Now I am anxious. Okay, that's something for which you need to seek God as a refuge. And this psalm should fortify your heart. And then all kinds of other things. You know, loss of honor, provision, loss of wealth, loss of a loved one, loss of favor with others, people in the church, an employer, parents, children. Uh, Loss of closeness with family, loss of health, uh, a loss of safety. If you're fearful of any of those things, then this should be an occasion for you seeking God as a refuge. And really anything, if you, any desire you have, if you have, you know, something outside of these categories I'm mentioning explicitly, just, just go find a desire you have. And that desire you can bet is going to be an occasion to not make God your refuge. Any desire, even good desires. I have a good desire to help others be godly. Well, when you don't get that, you're going to be tempted to sin against the Lord and make it happen on your own terms. Ditch God's plan and do it yourself. God, that's not working, right? All of these are occasions for which we need to make God our refuge. And so this Psalm Specifically tonight, we'll move through six strategies from this psalm for making God our refuge. Six strategies for making God our refuge. Again, verse one, God is our refuge and strength and abundantly available help in distress. The first strategy that this calls to mind is simply to study God's attributes. Study God's attributes. If you're going to seek God as a refuge, if you are going to intentionally make him your refuge, then you need to know some things that are true about God or else you will not find him worthy of being your refuge. The person who who makes God their refuge is the person who is compelled by truth to do so. You understand this, right? You would never do this unless you thought it made perfect sense for you to do. You would never seek God as a refuge unless you knew that he is a good refuge to be sought after. 
So to do that, to think of God in those terms, you actually need to know some things that are true about God. Kyle said this a few weeks back in his equipping hour, why a Bible-centered ministry. You can't obey more than you know. Impossible. No one's ever done it. You've never obeyed truth that you were ignorant of. And so you have to specifically, when it comes to God's attributes, when it comes to his character, we have to be people who know who God is. When you distrust God, it is because, at least in that moment, you do not believe something true about God. And you could nail down every single sin, every single failure to submit to God as he deserves, you could nail this down to a specific attribute, a specific truth, a specific passage of scripture even that you chose not to believe in that moment. And so let me just give you some, char- some characteristics, some categories of God's attributes that you must know in order to consider him a worthy refuge. How about his power? his power. You must be well acquainted with God's omnipotence. If in the moment when distress and trouble come upon you that you didn't ask for, you didn't plan for, you didn't wake up this morning, say, you know what? I don't think I'll have that trial enter into my life today. You need to be already well acquainted when God has chosen that trial for you with his omnipotence, with his power. Otherwise, you will not seek him as a refuge. A powerless refuge is really no refuge at all. So if you don't know God's power, then you won't seek him as if he is a suitable refuge. We just think about that. We retreat to a person or a place for safety who we believe, now we could be wrong, we believe they can protect us. Um, when, when I was holding my son this weekend at the DeShields wedding, they're happily married, by the way, Alex and Hannah. When we were meeting new people at that wedding and I'm holding my son Nash, when new people approached us and commented on how sweet a baby he looked, he sort of curled up next to me, right? I don't know this person. I'm not really comfortable around them but I do know dad and he's holding me. I want to be close to dad. He believes that there's safety here where there may not be in the other person. That's a a suitable picture for what we should be doing to God, drawing near to him when things that we cannot trust, that we're uncertain of are close to us. And so we have to be assured of God's power. Also his trustworthiness, his faithfulness. If you didn't trust God, if you didn't believe that he was faithful, then you would not retreat to him for safety. You would go from one danger to, oh, nope, danger that way too. I can't, that's also unstable. And so you wouldn't trust him. You have to believe that he is faithful. That when you retreat to him, you will find a trustworthy refuge and and sure safety. What about his immutability? God does not change. When the earth changes, the psalmists say that because God is our refuge, even when those things happen, the most sure footing that we have to stand on, the earth itself, we have no cause to fear. You wouldn't trust God if he was as changeable as the circumstances and the earth around you, the people as changing as the people around you. So he must be immutable. Do you, do you see that when you come to the scriptures? Do any passages come to mind that, oh, I can trust God because this scripture says he's not changing. Hebrews 1, perhaps. God says of the son. He'll roll up the earth like garments, but he will not change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Familiarize yourself with Hebrews chapter 1. What about mercy or compassion? To withdraw to God, the one who is more merciful than the changing or dangerous circumstances around you. 
How about the fact that he's spirit? This means that there's no limit to him in the same way that there is to you. So when you come to the end of your own resources, God who is spirit and lacks no strength, he has no members like us, so he, nothing is out of his reach. He lacks no strength because he has no muscles from which he must draw his strength. He is just spirit. He lacks no brain that has a limited uh, capacity to process information. So he can have infinite and limitless knowledge. You need to know that God is spirit and be confident in that particular attribute. And then on and on and on, we could add his righteousness, justice, wrath, his knowledge, the fact that he hears and sees, his wisdom and understanding, his omnipresence. In particular, to just draw attention to his omnipresence, just look at what the psalmist say in verse one. He's our refuge and strength. What? An abundantly available help or a very present help in distress. Here's what Spurgeon had to say about that verse. He says that God is more present than friend or relative can be, yea, more nearly present than even the trouble itself. Are you convinced about that, about God? When trouble comes upon you, I don't need to fear the trouble. There's a greater reality in view, God himself. God's more real, more near than whatever's troubling me. And that should not only inspire worship in us and praise, but also fearful reverence to know the most dangerous and fearful thing is not outside of me, nor is it even inside of me if my anxieties are there. The most fearful thing is God himself. He also dwells in me. He is near. He is available. And he is the judge whom I must obey. He's the savior who saved me to obey. I should be more fearful of disobeying him than of whatever circumstance may or may not happen to me. And this one who is omnipresent is not omnipresent to judge me if I'm a believer. He is, according to verse one, an omnipresent help, abundantly available for help. And this leads to the sixth strategy that I have in mind, contemplate the greatness of God's attributes. Don't just know who God is, know what God is and know that he is great in those things. Do you train your mind? Do you train your heart to notice when you read scripture, the adjectives and adverbs attached to God's attributes that just heighten the description of them? We have one in verse one. Notice again, verse one, what kind of help is he? He's a present help, but not just a present help. He's a very present help. The the word there has to do with exceedingly or greatly present. I mean, the psalmist is striving for words to help you know just how available he is. Yeah, he's there, but to a great degree exceedingly so he is there. Train your heart to notice those small but significant words in scripture, very present. And it's all over. Great mercy, rich in grace, etc. Those words that heighten or describe, capture the greatness of God, train yourself to notice them. That will help you make God a refuge when you're convinced of these things beforehand. I know who my God is, and I know that he is, and that he is great. My inclination is to run to him in troubling times. The third strategy, again, not even leaving uh, the beginning of the Psalm, this first movement, the third strategy, resolve to fear nothing except God alone. Resolve to fear nothing except God alone. Just look at the resoluteness of the psalmist. He puts these words in the mouths of 
Israel. Verse 2. Therefore, on thus, we will not fear. Don't you just love how we get to sing truths that sometimes you might be singing it and it just doesn't feel true. I know, I know this past week that is, man, I wish I was there. And now I have to sing it like it is true of me. You should sing it like it's true of you. Even if you realize that practically perhaps it's not, if you can't sing it because it's true of you in the moment you're singing, then sing it because you want it to be true of you. This is practically what's happening. We will not fear. They're resolved to not fear when these things come up, uh, when these things come up on the earth, when they happen. We will not fear. This is heart shepherding 101. That therefore in verse 2, on thus, it's on that truth that we're going to resolve not to be afraid. Have you done that? Have you attached your, the resoluteness of your will to a specific truth in Scripture? You must do that if you're going to faithfully obey, faithfully walk before the Lord in this life. You must attach the resoluteness of your will to obey to specific truths from Scripture that empower obedience. To do anything else, to just be resolved, detached from truth, is actually arrogant. Because that's just trying to obey on your own strength. I'm going to obey because it's most convenient for me. Or I'm going to obey because I'm just convinced that's the right thing to do. You better know what God says in his word requires whatever you're resolved to do. Yes, please be resolved to obey, but know why you should obey. What truth from God's word ought to compel me to live in this way? That is the essence of heart shepherding, to believe the truth and to obey the truth. I need to know how to live. I need to know the implications based on what God says is true, how I should walk before him. And then I need to be resolved to, yes, go do that thing. Go submit to the truth practically now. That is the essence of heart shepherding. That's what we call it. That's familiar phraseology around here. Heart shepherding, shepherd your heart. That's what, that, that's what we're, we're talking about. Hopefully that's what you mean when you use the phrase, shepherd your heart. At the internal level, at the heart level, Because you've known the truth, you've saturated your heart with the truth. The word of God is richly dwelling within you. Sometimes it spills forth in song. And because you are the Psalm 1 type of man or woman or child, God's word, I am meditating on that, the law of the Lord, day and night. Because that's true of me, well, then I live this way. I tell my heart what to do. I don't just follow whatever natural inclination comes into my mind. No, instead, I purposefully, intentionally meditate on the truth. And then I decide, I tell my heart, we're going this way. Uh -uh Uh-uh-uh. Don't feel that way. Feel this way, right? Your emotions, your thoughts, your will, your decision your choices, your desires, you're shepherding your heart, all of those things that come in your heart, you're telling it which way to go. And you're telling it to go in the direction of the truth that you have meditated on. And that's what the psalmists are able to do here in song form. Strategy number four, just from the psalm, Get clear on your eschatology. Get clear on your eschatology. You want to get better at retreating to the Lord? You want to get better at running quickly to King Jesus when life gets upended? Then get clear on your eschatology. That's what the psalmists do. Uh, It is just um, a grief to hear Christians saying things like, I don't worry about eschatology or 
eschatology is not clear, so I don't know. Maybe I'll figure it out one day. Or the gospel is clearer than eschatology <laughs> when the same God spoke a clearer word regarding both of them. People who've said that, maybe out of ignorance or innocence, they're not saying that from wisdom. There's nothing, nothing from God's word that would lead us to think that way about this area of end times doctrine. Was, was the gospel clearer than eschatology to Adam? No, they were actually the same thing. A future word about the Savior to come. Eschatology was his gospel. And so if it wasn't clear then, then neither was clear. The reason we, we can say that, by the way, as New Testament Christians is because some things have happened already. And so we say, hey, it's clearer. Well, maybe to us, subjectively clearer, sure. But biblically, God spoke a clear word, and it's all clear. And we should work hard to get clear ourselves on what God has clearly said. Um, the way that this compels you to make God your refuge if you are clear on not just past events, you know, biblical narratives, uh, events in your own life, if you can thankfully see those things clearly, but if you're clear about something that hasn't even happened yet because God has said it is going to happen, just think of what kind of confidence that makes you put in God's word. I don't believe him about the things that I can see, right? You can dig up uh, archaeological sites and say, oh yeah, God said that happened and we have evidence. Well, that's easy. But what about the things that are unseen, the future realities? If you can learn to see those things clearly in scripture and count those as certain as things that can be proven with artifacts, then that already makes you situate your hope in God's word because God has said it. You're not waiting for the future to be proven to believe it. You're believing God and just taking him at his word. And so that person who's clear on the future even has that many more reasons to take God at his word. And so that should be motivation for us to get clear on eschatology. So you can get better at just trusting God and taking him at his word. Reason number five, strategy number five, receive instruction from biblical narrative. Receive instruction from biblical narrative. Just think about how this happens, is happening in verses 7 and in verse 11. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. And that's repeated twice. It's the chorus of the psalm. Why Jacob? Why not the God of Israel? You know, after his name was changed and he stopped being that treacherous individual, and God finally humbled him, but he wrestled with God, saw the face of God, and survived. Why not the God of Israel? Or even, we're in a text about the future. Notice that that occurs in the two movements specifically about the future. Um, and when Israel is finally at peace with God, he's dwelling comfortably in her midst. King Jesus has arrived. Why not the God of that people? Right? The man Israel or that repentant people in the future. There's a reason he's saying the God of Jacob. This calls to mind for everyone singing the psalm, man, Israel was not always Israel. And Jacob, the one who grasps at the heel, the deceiver. Man, yeah, this is, this is his God. A great reminder. Um, to receive instruction from this character who's recorded for us in biblical narrative, the, the Genesis account specifically, that God even saves God, uh, people like him. God can even be the God of an individual like Jacob, treacherous, schemer, deceiver, his God. He learned to walk by faith. He believed the promises. Hebrews 11, even recalling a time at the end of his life when he's on the deathbed, 
uh, his own deathbed, the author of Hebrews recalls this moment of faith. Just listen uh, as this is as this is recorded specifically about Jacob. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. Verse 21 in Hebrews 11, by faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaving on the top of his staff. By faith, by faith, he died in faith, believing the promises of God. And helpfully, just that phrase, the God of Jacob, that's right, Jacob died in faith. Own his God, lay claim to his God, make his God your God. The same shepherd of Jacob, the same God who Jacob made his stronghold, we claim the same God. 1 Corinthians 10, you can write down Romans 15. Call us to receive this kind of instruction that gives us encouragement to walk faithfully and not sin against God to walk by faith. So receive instruction instruction from biblical narrative. Notice those instructive moments in scripture and let those characters even be so instructive to you that you can draw implications from their lives for the current day. And then finally, the sixth strategy, make time for meditation. Make time for meditation. This is specifically what's happening in verse 10. It's the only part of the psalm where God speaks in the first person. And God invites us, all who would sing, read, study, preach this psalm, to do this. Verse 10, Psalm 46. Cease striving. This is a command to stop. Be still and know something. And it's this, that I am God. Be still and call to mind this fact, I am God. What does that mean? That means we can be confident in the words that follow. This one who is God, the God of Jacob, our stronghold, the ones who... who, the one who is our refuge and strength, he will be one day exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. King Jesus will one day reign, not just in heaven, on earth. You can count on that future day. And if you desire to see that day, then you must make that same crucified and resurrected one your refuge now. All who draw near to him in faith seek to draw near to God through him will see this day when he is exalted among the nations. And it will be a glorious reign. Things like wars ceasing, verse 9 will come about worldwide peace, no use for weaponry anymore because King Jesus will put an end to all conflict. All those who make God their refuge will see this day. And so currently you should make time to reflect on that. If you are sure of that in your private moments, then when trouble comes upon you, you will be better equipped and more inclined to flee to God for safety. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this incredible psalm, even the ways that your word practically instructs us, just reminds us that all scripture is breathed out by you and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. And yes, even practical training in righteousness. And these wise words from you help us to be equipped, even fully equipped for every good work. And I pray that this psalm would be an enduring monument to that reality, that it would be um, an enduring 
compelling uh, text of scripture that makes us walk in a way that is worthy of the Lord, worthy of the gospel, uh, until we see the day described here come to fruition. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come quickly, that you would avenge yourself on the earth, and that you would keep us safe and bring us safely into your eternal kingdom. And we ask all this in your name. Amen.